The post-World War I years in the United States have been called a lot of things, but generally they are known as the Roaring Twenties. That's because of the social upheaval that took place during that era. Part of the reason for the spread of these new social and cultural ideas was the development of mass media. It was not until the 1920s that you had motion pictures in the format that we would know them today. It was not until the 1920s that you had radio that was nationally broadcast. And you had weekly news magazines like Life that were national publications. And so the media spread out across the nation. Media was no longer just your local newspaper. It was now national. It was the era known for the flappers, the mostly young women who decided the old Victorian standards of dress and standards of action were not for them. It was the era of prohibition when the 18th Amendment had outlawed the manufacture and sale of alcoholic beverages in the United States. Those who wanted a drink, however, were willing to break the law, and millions did. Despite well-staged raids like this by the authorities, most of the alcohol sales and distribution went on unchecked. In a, many cases, the authorities, perhaps it happened for this picture, would alert, alert the news media that they were going to bust a liquor warehouse. Then they would clear it with the bootleggers, the guys that were bringing in the illegal booze, and stage a photo op. Bars, saloons, and nightclubs became known as speakeasies. There are a lot of theories on how they got that name. My favorite one, although it may not be the correct one, is that when you came up to the door of one of these establishments, a guard would be there and you'd have to whisper the password or speak easy. Prohibition gave rise to organized crime, to the gangsters, to the Al Capones, and other famous notorious gang leaders, because it took organization to be able to either manufacture or smuggle in massive quantities of alcohol. And it was very lucrative. The 1920s was also the era when the automobile became available because of low prices for the masses. That meant that ordinary people could now afford an automobile. Now, the keepers of morality were shocked at what was going on in these automobiles because particularly young people could now get in their car and get away from their parents and anybody who knew them and maybe get in the back seat and have a little play. In fact, Henry Ford, who invented the Model T, and whose car was the best-selling car of that era, heard about this going on in the back seat and he was shocked. And he ordered the back seat of the Model T to be made smaller so you could not comfortably get in the back seat and have sex. Women, many of whom had worked in jobs replacing men during World War I, found new ways of self-expression, not just their dress as flappers or whatever, but also with being able to go out and publicly could go into a speakeasy. That was no longer seen as unladylike. Smoking cigarettes, dancing, all of these 
developed during the 1920s as women found ways to express themselves as women. It was the era of jazz, jazz providing the soundtrack of, for this new freedom. Now, jazz had originated mostly in New Orleans in the whorehouses known as Storyville. During World War I, those establishments were closed down and many of the musicians who made their living playing in those places had to find new gigs. They began to move up the Mississippi River, many of them going to Memphis, but a lot of them also going to Chicago, where this picture was made of the original Dixieland Jazz Band. This was an all-white band who had their roots in New Orleans, and they recorded the first jazz record. King Oliver's original jazz band also made its way from New Orleans to Chicago. They became the most famous jazz band of the early 20s. You'll notice a difference between them and the original jazz band that I showed you a minute ago. King Oliver's band was black. And in fact, it was King Oliver who sent for a young boy from New Orleans who had, used to follow him around and get, get trumpet lessons from him. He needed another trumpeter in his band in Chicago, so he sent for this boy from, from New Orleans. The young man packed his suitcase, took a train, ended up in Chicago playing for King Oliver. That young boy was Louis Armstrong, who became one of the most famous American musicians of all time. A jazz trumpeter, a singer, an actor, and an ambassador for American music all over the world. Another form of music that spread out of the Mississippi Delta and up across the entire country was the blues. Bessie Smith was the empress of the blues. She sold more than a million records of her singing the blues. If you don't know Bessie Smith, you need to, because these two musical methods, jazz and blues, would combine in the 1930s and 40s and would become known as R&B. And R&B would evolve into rock and roll. Now this new upbeat music required new kinds of dances. You couldn't really waltz to jazz. And so they began to invent new dances. They became dance craze. The most famous of these was the Charleston. And with radio and the other mass media, these new forms of music swept the nation, set people's toes to tapping, their feet to dancing, a new freedom because of jazz. Since the 1920 census showed for the first time that more Americans lived in urban areas than in rural areas, urban areas had restrictions. You couldn't go out and play in the field anymore. And so spectator sports grew huge. The most famous of these was the New York Yankees with Babe Ruth. And he became more than just a ball player. He was the first pop icon, if you will. He was the first Justin Bieber or Britney Spears or whatever. He was known much more than just as a baseball player. Another pop icon that emerged in the 1920s and became a national hero 
was a young man named Charles Lindbergh. He became famous because he, in his plane, the Spirit of St. Louis, became the first person to fly solo across the Atlantic Ocean. Started in New Jersey, I believe it was, landed outside of Paris, all by himself. Now, this was before they had navigation tools and everything else. Basically, he had to stay awake the whole time so he wouldn't get off course. This was such a famous uh, event that he got ticker tape parades when he got home. He was an instant celebrity. And his plane, if you go to the Air and Space Museum at the Smithsonian Institution, is hanging in the rafters. You can see his plane. Boxing also became a huge spectator sport and even more popular when they began to broadcast it on radio. And you would have national radio broadcasts of the major fights of the era. Politics did play a role in the 1920s not as visibly as the cultural stuff, however, but it was an attempt by the Republicans to turn back the clock. Orangey Harding ran for president with his running mate Calvin Coolidge, known as Silent Cal because he never said anything, and they won the 1920 presidential election first election in which women could vote. And they won it on the theme of returning to normal, or as he called it, normalcy. Made English teachers cringe because that was not a word. But what he was really saying was we want to get all of this stuff behind us. We want to get the war behind us. We want to get all of those reforms of progressivism behind us. We want to return to the way things were in the good old days. And he won. And this brings us to one of our themes of the 1920s. Some people want to turn back the clock, get to where they were, where they were comfortable. Before all of this new stuff started happening, a return to normalcy, as Harding called it. And that was one part of the society. However, one part of getting back to politics as normal was the re-empowerment of the political machines and the political bosses. Harding had been the governor of Ohio, and he brought with him to Washington some of his buddies from Ohio and he put them in political jobs, Secretary of Interior, all those kinds of positions. And while he was carrying on as normal, for instance, hosting poker games at the White House, where the bootlegger would bring in the beer and the uh, whiskey for his poker playing buddies, they were also trying to profit for themselves. That had been the 19th century tradition. Politicians went into politic politics to get rich through graft, through uh, kickbacks, through looting the public purse. That was the reason one went into politics. That had changed somewhat during the 1900s, during the progressive era. But now it came back with a vengeance with these guys that Harding brought with him from Ohio. And they began to get caught. The most famous of these scandals was the Teapot Dome scandal, where the Secretary of the Interior was caught selling government oil to the oil companies and pocketing the money. So, a return to normal was not all it was cracked up to be, at least for those guys that landed in jail. 
Now, there was never any indication Harding knew what was going on, that he was pocketing money, but his guys that he brought in with him certainly did. Now, one last gasp of progressivism happened during the 1920s. It was called the Washington Naval Conferences. You'll recall that one of Wilson's 14 points was to try disarmament rather than having an arms race. And the world decided to try that at the Washington Conferences. And so a series of treaties among the various nations of the world were signed pledging to scrap their military hardware. So here you see a picture, for example, of one of the American battleships being torn up and sold off for scrap. Disarmament rather than an arms race. While the politicians were trying to return to the good old days when government stayed out of business, when businesses were free to do whatever they wanted to, no regulation, that sort of thing. The rest of the country was reacting to what they had expected to happen as a result of World War I, but which hadn't happened. You remember that the reason, one of the reasons that Wilson stated for going to war was to make the world safe for democracy. But after World War I, was the world becoming more democratic? No. The American people saw the Russian Revolution and the emergence of a dictatorship under a communist form of government, the complete enemy of capitalism. They saw the Irish rebel against occupation by Great Britain and a war broke out between England and the Irish. Certainly this was not what Wilson had envisioned, a world at peace. In Italy, you didn't have the emergence of democracy. You had the rise of a fascist dictator in Mussolini. The world seemed to be turning to dictators rather than democracy. But the American people had been promised that if we would go to war, it will be to spread democracy. And so their expectations were not being fulfilled. This led to disillusionment and the American people saying, hey, it's not worth it. I'm not even gonna try anymore. On the home front, workers who felt like they had not shared in the riches that their companies had enjoyed because of government contracts during the war began to strike. There were thousands of strikes uh, with the workers demanding their share of the profits. And some of these turned violent. There was upheaval in the streets as workers struck to try to get more money. But these strikes were happening at the same time that you had the communists taking over Russia. And part of the communist manifesto is that there will be worldwide revolution that will turn capitalist countries into communist countries. That was what part of what Karl Marx wrote in Dos Capital. And so when the workers began to rise up, some of them were socialists, some of them were communists, but the vast majority were not. They were just seeking to get pay increases since their wages had been frozen during the war. But the industry leaders began to use an old tactic. They said all of this trouble that was being caused by the unions was really the communists trying to take over America. Now, Russia had nothing to do with this. 
they were having enough trouble just consolidating their victory in the Russian Revolution. But the industrial leaders and some political leaders were successful in painting these workers who were trying to unionize, trying to strike for better wages as part of the communist conspiracy to take over the world. And thus the United States had what was called the Red Scare. And there were acts of violence. This is a picture of what happened after a car bomb went off outside of the stock exchange on Wall Street. But those who wanted to paint everything that working men, labor unions were trying to do as bad, those who wanted to paint any kind of civil disobedience as bad, blamed it on the communists. So anytime anything went wrong, anytime people started to organize to try to change things, they were immediately labeled communists. And so it became a fairly common belief that communism was by, behind anybody who dared speak out against the status quo. This also led to what became known as Palmer raids. Palmer raids were raids on suspected communists. Mitchell Palmer was the attorney general, and he organized a special unit within the Justice Department. And he put a young man without any previous law enforcement experience in charge of it. Their duty was to round up suspected communists, either throw them in jail or deport them. And that's what they did. They broke into Newspapers, for example, that supported a socialist viewpoint, and they would wreck all of the uh, equipment, arrest the publishers, clearly a violation of the First Amendment. But that's how afraid of communism Americans were during the Red Scare. Oh, and by the way, that young man who was put in charge of that special unit in the Justice Department, his name was J. Edgar Hoover, and that special department he was in charge of became known as the FBI. And they were able to round up and deport people like Emma Goldman. Now, Emma had several strikes against her. Number one, she was Jewish. Number two, she was an immigrant. Number three, she was a socialist. And number four, she believed that women should be able to have sex, whether they were married or not. In fact, she distributed literature on contraception. Well, four strikes and she's out of the country. They rounded her up, put her on a mock trial, and just put her on a boat. She was gone. Two laborers were not so lucky. Sacco and Vanzetti lived in a neighborhood where a murder took place, but because they were known to be in favor of labor unions, they were therefore agitators. And with no evidence, they were arrested for this murder that took place in their neighborhood. And with no evidence, they were convicted and executed. That's how fearsome this fear of the of communism and of foreign influence was in the United States during the 1920s. Another example of this trying to get back to the good old days that was part of the 1920s was the rise of evangelist preachers, the rise of fundamentalism. One of the leading um, members of this group was Amy Simple McPherson. She established a large tabernacle in Los Angeles 
where she would pray and where she would cast out illness and demons by laying on of hands. And she used modern technology like loudspeakers so she could have a bigger church, like the radio to spread her message. And so part of this 1920s uh, trying to regain the past can be seen in fundamentalist religion. Another famous evangelist was Billy Sunday in Chicago. He's a former athlete, and so he filled his sermons with images of fighting the devil and alerted his congregation and those who heard him that the devil was present and you must fight the temptations that the devil gives you. Now, some of these evangelists began to use the radio. In the 1920s, you had the formation of the first radio networks where you could hear a broadcast from New York or Chicago or Los Angeles. And people could get a radio through the Sears catalog. And so it became the must-have must communication apparatus of the 1920s. And in many cases, the radio became a social gathering point, whether it be for the family or the neighborhood. People would gather around the radio to listen to music, maybe to dance to music, to listen to the new fangled soap operas, so named because they were usually in the afternoon when women were home doing housework. And so the advertisers for these radio dramas were soap companies, thus the name soap opera. It might be a sporting event, but the point is that the radio became the instant communication for many Americans. And you could listen wherever you were. I remember talking to my mom. She grew up in a little town called Muleshoe, Texas, which is out between Lubbock and Clovis, New Mexico, in the middle of nowhere, believe me. But she remembers gather, the family gathering around to listen to the radio. It was a family evening. That was the entertainment. That was the source of news. And so you get a national media that can touch virtually any place in the country. And when my mother was sitting there in Muleshoe, Texas, listening to her radio, she was hearing programming from New York. She was hearing jazz from Chicago. And so the whole country was being invaded by these new images, these new forms of music, these new ideas that helped to spread the more modern point of view. The mail order catalogs became huge because now you didn't have to live in a city and go to the store to get stuff. Think of these as Amazons in print form. So you'd get the Sears catalog or the Montgomery Wards catalog, and you could go through there and order a new bathtub, new clothes. You could even buy a prefab house that would be delivered to you in pieces and you would then erect it. Early on, you could buy a car through the mail order catalog, which you would then put together once you got all the parts. National marketing as a result. On the radio, you begin to get national products and ads for national products. So no longer is the economy just primarily local, it is national. 
It was in the 1920s that the automobile became a transportation mode for the common man. Henry Ford's innovations in production lowered the cost so much that now most every American could afford to buy one of his Model T Fords. And this changed the way we lived, the way we traveled, and particularly it changed the ec economy because automobile manufacturing became and was until the 21st century, the largest industry in the American economy. Another sign of these changing social standards was women's dress. Here you have a group of middle-aged, maybe, uh, women practicing dancing the Charleston. Their dresses are up above their ankles. In fact, one is so daring She's actually wearing pants. Oh, the scandal. So how much did the standards change? Take a look at these two pictures. 1893, the young woman on the left in her corset, in her dress that goes to her ankles, in sleeves below her elbows. But by 1925, look at the mode of dress. Short sleeves, short skirts, no corset. And this woman in 1925 was not in some fancy New York or Chicago or LA. No, this picture was taken in rural Tennessee. That's how much the social climate had changed in just a few years. Another event that helped change the social climate was known as the Great Migration. This is when somewhere in the neighborhood of a million African-Americans fled the South moved into the north and particularly northern cities where they could find industrial work. This began during the war. And so they moved to Detroit, Chicago, Milwaukee. And they were still segregated. They were still discriminated against. They were segregated in that they had to live in certain parts of town. But in those towns, or in those segments of towns where African Americans lived, they were able to bring a thriving culture. In fact, that's where King, uh, King Oliver was. His jazz band was in a black honky-tonk in Chicago, but the word got around and whites became uh, customers and began to buy his records. And African-Americans were finding jobs in Northern industry. They were taking their place alongside whites on the assembly lines, getting paid a regular wage. And this particularly happened during the war when many uh, white workers went off to fight and there was a shortage of labor. And so African-Americans were able to get those jobs. That's not to say that African-Americans did not fight, they did. They were some of the most ferocious troops in the American army. And they were fighting for democracy, to make the world safe for democracy. But when they got home, they started fighting for democracy at home for themselves. And African-American troops made sacrifices in the war. 
wounded, killed, but they served. And this gave them a new attitude as they headed home. In fact, it was a black troop that the Germans feared the most. The Germans named them the Hellfighters because they were so ferocious in battle. They were so effective that the government of France gave them the highest military honor, the Croix de Guerre, to the 369th Colored Regiment. So as these black troops came home, or as the black factory workers had started to enjoy the fruits of a steady job, white America rose up, determined to return things to the way they were before the war. And so you had a tremendous surge in racism and in terrorism. But this racism was not just against African Americans. There was a, a rise in anti-Jewish sentiment. And one of the leaders of that was Henry Ford, who was a notorious anti-Semite. And his company newspaper, the Dearborn Independent, which all Ford dealerships were required to give away, contained rants about the problem the Jews were call it, causing in the world. So for those who were looking to turn back the clock, you had a return of nativism. If you weren't a white Anglo-Saxon American, you were a lesser person. If you were a Catholic, if you were a Jew, if you were black, if you were Mexican, they were all targets of this nativism that grew up during the 1920s. In fact, the Ku Klux Klan was reborn in the 1920s and became mainstream. Here you have a march of the Klan down Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington, D.C. It was accepted. How mainstream was the Klan? The great state fair of Texas had Klan Day when you could bring your friends and celebrate being a member of the Klan. The Fort Worth Klan was very visible during the 1920s, posing for this picture in their uniforms, saying they were for God and country. But what they were really saying was they were for white Protestants. Even churches had their Klan celebrations. Here you have a minister welcoming members of the Klan to this service and preaching about how Jesus saved, at least I guess in this case, saved white folks. You had serious racial violence around the country. This picture happens to be in Chicago, but there were race riots elsewhere as whites attacked the black sections of town. Now, part of this was economic. Part of this was because they returned home from the war and they found black people in their old jobs and they wanted their jobs back. And so it was a big uh, attempt to push African-Americans in particular back into the subservient role that they had had before the war, before they had been war heroes, and forced them out of those jobs that they had come north to get. And in most cases, the whites were successful. And this reduced 
the uh, status of African Americans once more. And there was a, an increase, an explosion, really, of lynchings. Lynching, particularly of African Americans, had not been a popular practice during the slavery era, during the Civil War, until the 1920s, when the Klan began to use it as a form of terrorism. Now, you might say the Klan. Well, this picture is not some southern redneck town. This is a picture taken in Ohio. Look at the people down below. The couple on the left, for example. Hey, let's go have a date and go watch the lynching. That's how acceptable it was. And no white person was ever convicted of killing a black person. That's just the way things were. It wasn't right, particularly by our standards today, but that's what African Americans, when they refer to the inequities in America, this is part of the roots of that, this lynching. There was even racism in the music. I've given you here two examples of people singing the same song or playing the same song. The St. Louis Blues. Bessie Smith sang the blues version of it. The Paul Whiteman Orchestra is playing the white version of it, which is more like a pop song than the blues. And so, even in the music, there was discrimination against something that was too black, too primitive, too raw. And it's one of the reasons why many of the jazz musicians of the 1920s, they will be swallowed up by the big band sound of the 30s and 40s. One difference that occurred during the 1920s, however, was that African Americans began to organize and push back against racism. As W.B. DuBose wrote, we return from fighting, make way for democracy. We saved it in France and by the great Jehovah, we will save it in the United States. So African Americans after the war had a new attitude, an attitude that we are going to push against the discrimination and the racism. So for example, the NAACP led protest, protest marches. In this case, they're protesting the movie, The Birth of a Nation. Birth of a Nation was the first feature length film ever made and thus it has a place in film history. But it all is also absolutely racist. There's not a frame of it that's not racist. It supposedly tells the story of the South during the, and after the Civil War and how black people ruined the South along with the damn Yankees. And so you have all of the cliche scenes. The uh, black people drinking whiskey. Actually, they're not black people in the movie. They are white actors that they black faced up. You have another scene where you have a, a wild, savage black man chasing the young white virgin through the forest, intent on raping her until she throws herself off the cliff to save herself from disgrace. It's an absolutely racist film. And so the NAACP organized protests against the showing of that movie. They organized protests against the explosion in the number of lynchings. 83 women lynched since 1889, calling on the president to outlaw lynching. 
So far, there is still no federal law against lynching. Some today are trying to change that. In response to the race riots, the NAACP held marches and demonstrations protesting that this was not right. They're pushing back. And this is really the first organized pushback against white racism. Yes, there had been individual leaders and there had been some of the abolitionists who were not racist, but this is really the first time that a large group of African Americans are uniting to take a stand against racism. The 1920s also saw the rise of what was called the Harlem Renaissance. It was an artistic celebration of being African American, of the African American life in America. And it celebrated the new Negro, as they called it, a Negro who was not going to be pushed around, who was proud of his heritage. And many of the artistic expressions of the Harlem Renaissance talk about black pride and how it's not something to be uh, looked down on, but being black is something to be proud of. Langston Hughes expressed it well in one of his poems, I Too Sing America. I am the darker brother. They send me to eat in the kitchen when company comes and I laugh and eat well and grow strong. Tomorrow I will sit at the table when company comes. Nobody will dare say to me, eat in the kitchen. And besides, they'll see how beautiful I am and be ashamed. I too am America. This sense of pride this sense of being black is not something to be ashamed of. This is really one of the first expressions of this kind of attitude. It's a new attitude by and large. And so it emerges during the 1920s and has a real impact, particularly on the black upper and middle classes. Because the Harlem Renaissance was about hope. Again, Langston Hughes, hold fast to dreams for if dreams die, life is a broken winged bird that cannot fly. And so you have these new expressions of hope that things are gonna change for African-Americans. And it's encapsulated in the artistic works of the Harlem Renaissance. Another movement among African Americans that took place in the 1920s was in contrast to the Harlem Renaissance, which tended to appeal to the more uh, artistic, educated audience. This other movement was headed by Marcus Garvey. And you notice the sign, the new Negro has no fear. This was what Garvey preached. It was, he founded the United Negro Improvement Association and created chapters of it all over the country, but he kept dues low, like maybe a penny a month, a nickel a month. And so it was an appeal to the grassroots and millions of African-Americans joined Garveyism. Now, Marcus Garvey was an immigrant from Jamaica, but he was a charismatic leader and he knew how to appeal to people to get them excited about being involved. And part of his uh, 
program was to basically form a new nation within the nation, a black nation within the white nation. And he had fancy titles like the Chief of Universal African Legion and fancy costumes and pageantry that appealed to people. His new nation even had a flag. So the United Negro Improvement Association became a movement within the United States to empower black people. They were trying to get black people to do only business with black people. And it spread around the world as Pan-Africanism. Any place in the world where you had people of African descent, they were encouraged to join the movement. And so Marcus Garvey was really founding the first black power organization. He did not want to exist in concert with whites. He wanted to have a separate black nation, separate from whites. But within the United States, unless you wanted to go back to Africa, and that was another of his programs. In fact, it was one of the entrepreneurial ventures of the UNIA that ultimately was Garvey's downfall. He envisioned a worldwide rising of people of African descent. And he formed a steamship line, the Black Star Line, with the express purpose of taking people back to Africa if they wanted to go, and of trading with countries that were governed by people of African descent. So it was black to black business. That's what he was pushing. And so he formed this steamship line. Unfortunately, he was a much better uh, leader than he was businessman. And so his business people put out a, uh, a mailing, a letter to members, encouraging them to invest in the Black Star Steamship Line. And it was capitalized for $500,000, but so many of his followers wanted to buy stock that they ended up sell, selling about $1.5 million worth of stock. And that gave the authorities the power to pounce because they had broken the law. It was mail fraud. And Garvey was to blame, although Garvey more than likely didn't even know what was going on. But he took the fall because whites were getting a little um, nervous about this black power stuff. And so when they got the opportunity to get rid of Marcus Garvey, they did. They convicted him of mail fraud he was originally sent to the federal penitentiary in Atlanta. And ultimately, because he was an immigrant, he was deported back to Jamaica. And while Garveyism remained for a few years, it lost most of its steam without its leader. And so the conviction of Marcus Garvey because of the Black, Black Star Line really takes the impetus away from his movement. It was also during the 1920s that you had the first organizations trying to do away with discrimination against Spanish or Mexican Americans, generally called Hispanics or Latinos. And they're problem was much more difficult, as it turns out, than it was for African Americans, because there were laws on the books that discriminated against African Americans. 
For the most part, there were no, not laws on the books that discriminated against Mexican-Americans. And so they had to prove not only that were they being discriminated against, but that it was somehow illegal. That made it tough. The organization that emerged in the 1920s to help fight for equality for Hispanic Americans, for Latinos, was the League of United Latin American Citizens, or LULAC, still a vibrant organization today. That started in, 1920, in the 1920s. In fact, LULAC held its first national convention in Corpus Christi, Texas in 1929. And LULAC emerged then as a united voice against discrimination for people of Latin descent. Now, what you have heard me describe may sound too, like two different countries, the rise of the Klan and the Harlem Renaissance, the rise of fundamentalist religion and more modern ways of thinking. And that is the nature of the 1920s. I often think of it like a trapeze artist. You've all seen trapeze artists, where they swing out from their platform on their trapeze, they let go, they catch the next trapeze, and swing to the next side. Except in the 1920s, what the American public was more like was about a third of them would swing out and be afraid to let go and they would hang on and they would swing backwards, trying to recapture the past. Some would swing out and let go and have the freedom and catch on and move on. But the vast majority of Americans probably were caught someplace in between. It'd be kind of like they swung out and they held on to the old with one hand and they reached for the new with the other hand. That's what was going on in the 1920s. It was kind of schizophrenic. We were two nations, and you had people in the middle trying to do some of each. And that's what makes the 1920s so confusing. But let me, in closing, give you two examples of these two factions that are battling for American society. The first is Henry Ford. Henry Ford's Model T revolutionized the automobile industry. His use of the moving assembly line, the, the use of interchangeable parts, all of these improvements in production allowed him to make a car more cheaply than anybody else. And therefore he could get the price down to where uh, he could sell it to the general public, not just to rich people. And so he was, his assembly line and the low cost of automobiles just made automobile use explode and change the country forever. And so, he was modernizing the comp country. But at the same time his car was modernizing the country, Henry Ford was trying to hold on to the traditional ways. He hated jazz. He blamed it on the Jews. I mentioned that he had the size of the back seats in his Model T's reduced so it would not be comfortable for people to have sex in them. He even had morals police working for his company. And any employee, no matter when, could not drink alcohol, for example. And his spies would go around. And if they caught you drinking, even in your own home, you were fired immediately. He collected 
and a complete set of them Guppy's readers. Remember we talked about how those were teaching the old concepts of social Darwinism and of laissez-faire and of hard work and thrift and personal uh, discipline. That's what he believed. Another example of Henry Ford, this kind of split personality. In, up in Massachusetts, one of the old inns where the Sons of Liberty used to meet to plan the American Revolution had fallen into disrepair and it was going to be torn down. But he, oh no, that can't be torn down. So he bought it and he had it re restored. But the problem was that there was this highway running right close beside this inn. And it spoiled that the uh, atmosphere of an old country inn. And so he paid the state of Massachusetts a million dollars to move that road so it wouldn't interfere with his restoration of the past. But what was it that was driving on those roads? It was his cars. And so the duality, the schizophrenia, right here in one man, Henry Ford. So do we say Henry Ford was a great man or a great villain? He certainly was intolerant. He was certainly set in trying to hold on to the old traditional ways, but yet his business achievements were making it impossible to go back to the way things were. This is the tension. This is the duality of the 1920s. One more example of this combat between the traditional and the modern can be seen in the Scopes trial, the so-called monkey trials held in Dayton, Tennessee. And it is kind of in a nutshell, a battle between the old ways of thinking and the modern ways of thinking. Every day on the way to the courthouse, the participants walked under a sign that said, read your Bible. When they got into the courtroom, the judge opened every session with a prayer and with a Bible sitting on his uh, table. So the court was obviously biased because the case was about whether or not the biblical version of the creation of man and the world was literally accurate or not, or whether a more modern view of evolution should be taught. Outside the trial, it turned into a carnival with people selling their latest books, people selling popcorn and cotton candy. And it was just uh, like a show. But inside the courtroom, it was very serious. And it was all about what this guy had done. John Scopes. State of Tennessee had passed a law saying that it was illegal to teach anything but the biblical version of creation in public schools. John Scopes, with the backing of the uh, ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union, wanted to challenge the constitutionality of that law. And so he taught evolution in his biology class. And he was arrested and put on trial. Both sides brought in 
outside attorneys, orators, famous men, for the defense of fundamentalist religion, it was William Jennings Bryan, three-time candidate for president, former secretary of state, and former populist. For the defense, there was Clarence Darrow, probably the most famous defense attorney of the era. He was well known for defending people against the government people charged for breaking laws that should not have been on the books in the first place. And as the trial went on for days, the heat just built and built, and not just the rhetoric. It was steamy hot. They had to move the trial outside to get some relief from the blistering heat. And in the trial, Clarence Darrow did something that good defense attorneys do when they don't have a case. John Scopes had broken the law. That wasn't the point. They wanted to put the fundamentalist version of the Bible on trial. And so, when the judge refused to allow the defense to call scientific witnesses to testify to the validity of the theory of evolution, Darrow called William Jennings Bryan to the stand as an expert on the Bible. The judge said, Mr. Jennings, you don't have to go up there. But Jennings wanted to go and testify and, and state his beliefs as to the literal value of the Bible. And so Clarence Darrow began to question him. And some of the questions were kind of irritating after a while. For example, you really believe Jonah lived in the belly of a whale? Mr. Brian said, that's what it says in the Bible. That's what I believe. And you say, well, okay, the world was created in the sixth day and on the seventh day it rested. Do you know how long ago that was, Mr. Brian? Well, experts had put it in about 2,000 years ago. And Mr. Darrow said, well, then how do you explain that we have records going back more than 4,000 years? Wouldn't those records have been destroyed in Noah's flood? And by this point, Mr. Bryan's getting a little testy and saying things, well, I'll leave that to agnostics to figure out. But perhaps the most telling question that Darrow asked was, uh, you say that God created the earth on the second day. That's what it says in the Bible. Well, how'd they know it was the second day if there was no sun yet? Sun was created on the second day. What? How, how long was it before the sun was created? And Mr. Bryan kind of stumbled around on that one. And so basically, Scopes was convicted. But in the battle for public opinion, Fundamentalism came off as looking really out of date in comparison to modern thinking. Adding to the notoriety of this trial was the fact that there were live radio broadcasts from the courtroom while it was going on. This was the first time this had ever happened. And so people are tuning in for the novelty of just hearing live radio from a remote location. And they're hearing this trial go on. So here, once again, we had what it is the essence of the 1920s. Some people trying to hang on to the old belief system. 
some people embracing the modern belief systems. And what emerged from the Scopes trial was basically an image of the old way of thinking as not thinking at all, but rather a mandate thou shalt not think. But the time when people could worry about such social issues came crashing down with the stock market in 1929, which plunged the nation to, into the Great Depression. The time for high living and for paying attention to uh, social issues was over. For probably a quarter of the American population, the issue became, how am I going to stay in my home? How am I going to feed my family? Much more basic issues than fundamentalism or modernism. 